I've just started doing capture flags about five or six years ago, more so started at DEF CON as fun. And recently I've done a couple challenges with women in security where they've done meta FCT as well as they've done one for uh, target. The one I'm going to go over some of the items that were in the target CTF that we used and how I actually ended up using uh, ChatGBT to help me along the way. Um, there was uh, hints in there as well, but some of these were a little bit harder than <laughs> it's those of you that have done it. It was a lot more challenging, a lot of offensive and defensive stuff that being an engineer, I don't get to play with every day. So that's why I went to ChatGBT for the assistance. So the first one that they did here was a um, file exfiltration. So we got an email that told us that, hey, here's a file that came in and here's the backup file. You had to go find the password, passwords out of the backup file in order to find the capture of the flag. This one here was a little bit fun for me because I went through, I went through chat. So when I first went and did it through chat GBT, um, I was having me do John the Ripper, had me try a crack, <laughs> Um, and a few others. Uh, so I was able to at least get in there. I got the list and I kept going back and forth with getting the list saying, yeah, this wasn't working. Coming back. No, I actually ran all the John the Ripper passwords through it. And I got like, <laughs> it took me about four minutes of a video <laughs> showing just of me going back and forth. So we ended up actually, I ended up going and using, um, the BRAC, uh, VK crack, back crack for it. Um, I was struggling between Windows and running it on a Mac because the Mac wasn't giving me the answers. So I went back to Windows um, and the codes up here were showing where I actually was able to break the file, um, got the first set of passwords, then I had to go back in the second time and was actually able to decipher, decipher it. But chat was able to tell me, hey, you need, this is the password, this is the file. And then here's the second file. So there was three files within the zip that you actually had to have the passwords for in order to get the, the flag that was out of it. So by the time I actually deciphered the, the correct passwords from the files, um, it showed, I would decrypt the file and then it showed me, it gave us the flag at the end of it when you took it in and did the curl to it. So this one was the second one that we did is called, it was an insider threat. Um, they gave us some data about a regex, um, and it had in there, it was, you had to create from the words that were, that were used in there was using the lucky lion casino as part of the regex. And then it gave you a Python script that was provided. And I ran the Python script in the LLM and put the script in there as well as, Hey, this is the regex that it created. And it popped out the flag without a problem. Some of the challenge, were, some of them will, will go quickly. Others, you have to talk back and forth for them. And I do have, I do have the videos, but with this only being a 20 minute talk, I chopped the videos out. Um, the next one was breaking the EDR. Now this one, what they used, um, CyberGuard was the EDR we actually had to crack into. So we had, were able to a netcat into the box um, and you had to actually kill the EDR in order to get past it. The fun one with this one is I actually ended up doing it. This one took me a little while going back and forth because my skills with learning how to crack it and actually understanding what I was doing was half the battle because it would tell me to run a command. I read it and it, in the chat, it doesn't tell you what it should look like. So when you run the commands, if you're not paying attention, you keep going in loops. So I was going in loop after loop after loop, like looking for the process, killing the process, going in, looking for the files. <laughs> and then when you see the files, it's, it was, you could only do A, B, and C. And then I'd end up going back in circles, like, okay, no, the process isn't dead. Um, I ended up actually taking, this one here took me about two, three days to do because between doing work and stuff, I was going up and down on it where I'd do it get frustrated. So I ended up cheating. I bought all the points. I used about 200 points to get the right answer to find out as I was actually doing the work through the chat, I had the answer and didn't know it. So I was where I needed to be, but the final step of actually going in and looking at the file to get where I was to, uh, to get to this screenshot, I wasn't able to get to by using the chat. So I've also learned that not only you don't just rely on your chat, you go back and forth into, we were, when you did the challenge, you could ask other users questions, but they couldn't give you 
the answers. They could give you hints, but that was it. So if you were stuck on something, it wasn't going to happen. You were just going circles. Um, this last one is who in here writes Yara rules on a regular basis? <laughs> he didn't want to admit it. I've seen that. So this was probably one of my harder ones to do. We got a file. We got in into the system. We were trying to find a any desk executable that what the challenge was find a any desk ex executable that was ran. There was three of them that were ran, and there was over a hundred files on the system. You had to narrow it down to one file on the system. The catch was if you weren't paying attention to the last. The clue was if we weren't paying attention to our last um, clue before. There was actually an email sent with that executable in it. So I was I was having trouble writing the rules. So I'd go in and I'd get it down to three, and then I'd modify it. So I was looking for file name, headers, um, file size. So it kept going. I was like, I got it down to three, got it down to two. Then I got it down to zero. So this one, I kept going back and forth, fixing the rules and telling. We'd go back to chats like, you know, this was a bad one. Then it, And then tell, okay. We ended up doing um, PE, doing the headers. So the three most common things, I think I had a script that was about 20 lines. Come to find out the script on the right, right here, which you can't see. Um, that sucks, I'm sorry. Um, it was only four lines of code that it looked for. It looked for the date and hex, looked for the file size, and there was a hash. And the biggest thing was the date and time. But the catch we were running with the YAR was, was I was converting it to hex and making sure it was the right hex because it wasn't just a human readable format. Um, so this one, this one was a lot of us got stumped on. Some of the capture flags that I've done are just fun ones. So this one here was one where they just gave us an image. And in those images, we were able to, I took the image, put it in the chat, said, hey, what could this be? And because it was an electric, we were doing one uh, based on learning how to create badges that year, this happened to be a resistor. And it popped out what the resistor, the resistor and the ohms. But by looking at that image, that's the one thing chat is good for. You, you can do it for onset at times looking for places. I've done um, other challenges where I put images in there. A fun one was with the cybersecurity is they actually gave us an image of the fiber lines and asked, gave you the image and said, where does this fiber line connect overseas? So if you don't know, if you didn't know the image, it was the one in North Carolina in, um, Myrtle Beach. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that one, to me with onset, sometimes I have a problem with keeping it simple. I overlook it. And using chat sometimes brings me down. It also helps me in some of these challenges to focus on what the next steps are if I'm, if I'm failing. Because I can go back and say, hey, this did not work. It's, then it'll give you steps. Okay, try this. But it also explains to you what you're doing in those steps. You're not just sitting there not understanding the data that's there. No. Um, Another one is we did a Braille one as a challenge. So some of these you can just snapshot it in there and it'll put it right up there for you guys and, and give you guys the answer out. And that was the answer for that particular one. Um, we also have done ones that were uh, base 64 coding. So instead of going into CyberChef and you have to figure out what you're Xing and anding, this one will, the, um, some of the chefs will actually go in there and say, hey, this is the possibility. It's either base 64, it could be a Caesar, which one do you want me to try to decipher, to decipher with? So it gives you those options to go back and forth. One caveat about them is if you are doing too technical, you will get an error message that it will not help you if you are hacking. So you do have to tell the chat <laughs> that you are doing a capture the flag because it will specify that, hey, this is, this is hacking I can't help you with. But if you tell it, hey, this is part of a capture the flag, and you're educating, it, it gives you a little bit more answers. Exceptional engineer, the LOL. <laughs> Prompting matters. <laughs> Prompting does matter. So going through these challenges, there's a couple things that I found that do not work at all. Math questions, I made it hallucinate on a math question for about three days till I actually took it, started a new chat, and then it answered it right. But it, what I found out afterwards what, talking to people was that because I started – asking the question and adding, it kept using what it learned before to answer my question. So sometimes on some of the math questions, they, it just goes in circles. So you do have to break yourself out of that chat, start a new one. Um, 
the other ones I've found is if you, it's great at imp implementing documents and reading them, but don't ask it to read an image within a document for the answer. So if there's a screenshot within it or a, or a chart, it has problems reading those charts to give you the, if, especially if the answer's in the charts. Uh, I found that if going to web pages, if you asked it to look at a certain web page, or even sometimes you can ask it, it'll ask you, do you want me to connect? If the web page, web page or server that you're playing with isn't accessible from that LM, from the chat, it won't go to it. But it does try to connect, it will connect to some web pages that are publicly, if you, if you need access during the chats. Things I've learned through this, I've never written Python in my life. Um, some of the scripts actually of the chats were Python. So I've actually learned how to write Python script. I actually run it every day now at work through APIs, but I never knew how to do it before. It's also helped me learn how to do PowerShell coding for my APIs and to troubleshoot them, especially when you're trying to do projects that it that you never done before. The, the chat has helped in that. I've also learned that in a lot of the a lot of our capture the flags, the users, the creators are actually using that the chats to create our problems as well. So you, so it, they kind of go hand in hand with, with us going in and using them to learn. It's more of a learning tool, but it helps you when you don't have that buddy next door to you or your remote and nobody's near you. You can't just call a friend on it. Some of the stuff that's also taught me is they've had, we had a fun one on there was a, on the capture flag was a QR code and it was double embedded. So you actually, it was a QR code within a QR code you had to get the go in and change the URL and then recode it twice to ca capture the new flag. So the LM taught me basic steps on how to create the Q QR code through CyberChef, and then I was able to use that data to go ahead and create it. Um, the other things that I've done is it it walks me through steps like those of us who I don't play on my Mac as much, so my Mac was not set up for a lot of the stuff. So instead of me having to go read all the man pages, it was, I can just ask chat, hey, how do I install this? Copy the code and it would bring it up and install it. Um, it's also good for when I'm doing a lot of decoding on files. There's um, so a lot of the chats, a lot of our capture the flags, you can actually put some of our files in there, including the one we're doing here today. I've been playing with it all day. <laughs> so it, some of them, it pulls it out in an instance, others of them, it, others you have to work with it. Where do we go from here? Everybody's using AI, not only just for your capture the flags. You've got businesses nowadays that, we, that are doing hackathons for employees just to create the bots, to automate our work. You think about it, if you get a new software in, how much can, can the chat help you to actually pen test it for you internally? Where if you're doing the POC, hey, what items can I look at? What should I be looking at? There is one concern that everybody does bring up is the ethical consideration of using the chat. So the question is, are you using it to win or are you using it for education? You know, as long as, to me, as long as we're learning and we're, it's, you're still doing the work yourself because you have to know what to ask it. You have to know what to read into it. And I can see that it's, those of us in cyber, the more we do, you know, how many of us have had to read TCP captures and left and right where if you could have thrown it up in a, in a bot and let it do the reading and say, hey, I'm trying to do latency between A and B, show me the latency between the two files. Or you're looking for certain ports on a, within a Wireshark and if it, to bring those up. So even in the capture of the flags we've used, we've had, I've had some that we've had to use the vulnerabilities list and it says, hey, here's all your vulnerabilities. Which one is your top based on your network architecture? But if you don't know, one, you've got to know how to read your network architecture, but who's going to go in and see every single vulnerability? You know, it takes, it could take you 30 minutes just to read that document where you put it up in the, in the chat and say, hey, I need a list of all my, LLM, all of the, all the vulnerabilities. Which one is your top, what, what, how many is in this machine? And you can sort it however you want. So if you want to look per machine, per vulnerability, you have those options where instead of manually doing it, it, it makes a, the image a lot better, more readable, human readable instead of you having to search through it. So for me, I enjoy doing capture the flags and being, I like using the chat because it helps me learn. I'm trying, and if you're not doing all these different types of exploits or 
files every day or looking at EDRs and going into Linux box and popping it, you don't, you don't know how to do it. So I, I look at it more as a teacher and, and an enabler. And hopefully you guys learned something from this today. Thank you. Yes. You have a question? Go for it. Yep. So he's asking about the ethical, whether the chat is a personal chat, like closed environment versus one that's open. I want to do a personal model, honestly. I'm interested in actually creating my own to put a lot of this data into it versus it's open models will get you. It's all about the data that you put into it and where you get it. I don't think one gives the edge over the other because if you're putting in your own data, it's your own knowledge, even if, you know, but the open source ones is limited too. So there, there are certain things that it can't do. So you have to be able to do that. The question was, have I used any other AIs of, over ChatGPT if I've gone to Gemini or any other ones? As of right now, no. That's why I want to start creating my own with help from smarter people that I know. When I was using the free version of chat, I ran into limitations. So you can only put in, it can only analyze so much data and then you're blocked out for four to five hours. So I did end up paying for the next version up just for the cap, for the event because I kept <laughs> running into roadblockers and you had to wait four to five days, you know, four hours. So if it wasn't overnight and you were right in the middle of something, it's like, oh man. So the question is, is if, if the CTF says that there was no, you're not allowed to use an AI, then yes, you're correct. I wouldn't use the AI. It's, it's ethical. That's where it raises the ethical question. If it is saying in there, hey, we don't want you to use an AI. But the question is too, is, is the AI, yes, the AI gives you some of the answers, but does it give you all of them? You have to know how to ask the questions. You can't just put the question in there. Well, for some of them, you can put the question in, they'll give you the answer. But a lot of them, you have to prompt it for what you want to get out of it. So the question was that when I, in there, talking about the rails that it puts on, on you, the biggest rail that I've run into is it will tell you that, hey, this is hacking. I cannot give you the answer. Now, we've heard, I've heard it in a couple of talks between two people. There is some ways to jailbreak it. A lot of times it's putting Google, chat GBT against Gemini and telling them that the other one can do it. And it, <laughs> nine times out of some, 50-50, it may give you the answer, but it may not. But that is... It does tell you in certain ones that when you do go down that, hey, um, I got one today on one of the challenges I was doing that said, hey, this is not, this is hacking. But quotes, if you're doing it for capture the flag or work, then you specify in there. But you also have to remember too, especially with the open sources that you're using, all this data goes out in the public. It's still, it's, so it's out there to be used for somebody else, not only just you. Thank you guys for your time and coming to listen.